good afternoon to everybody i am dr shanti professor kt kalinga karnataka institute of technology i thank our management principal vice principal deans hod to organize this seminar i welcome all the participants to this wonderful event today topic is deep learning in telecommunication our chief guest is dr t sendil kumar associate professor in department of computer science and engineering amudai school of engineering goindur his research interest includes video analytics big data analytics intrusion detection systems he has uh, involved himself in developing in the competency areas in the programming uh, languages he published nine national conferences 12 international conferences 14 international journal 10 edited book volumes he has a 22 scopus index publication he has published a book in c++ he received a grant of 7.6 lakh under ibm shard university research sar has good experience in deep learning now i hand over this session to our honorable chief guest okay uh, so good evening to you all and uh, thank you madam for uh, doing this wonderful arrangement and uh, getting connected and sharing the experience is always good so keeping in forward to the audience of the session i will be taking you through uh, deep learning how it can be seen in telecommunication domain so my acknowledgement to my students in bachelors and masters in engineering who has been working with me Uh, on the same field, uh, and um, my PhD scholars who are working and continuing their research in the same area of deep learning, and my industry connects because, as you know, like uh, industry people do more of uh, the live requirements. So working with them also gives me more experience in how deep learning can be looked at multiple uh, segments. so today's session is to walk through and see how telecommunication can be taken as an area and see how deep learning can be applied as you from uh, electronics and communication department you would always think that telecommunication is a way in which uh, you can actually exchange signs signals messages words writings images and sounds or any information of any nature by sort of a wired medium or a wireless medium so there we look at radio or optical signals or in either electromagnetic systems now when there are users coming into this telecommunication domain then it becomes very important to formulate or understand what the users expect so what we are trying to see is if technology is in place to understand the users of the telecommunication uh, part what the users will expect if so how can you look at deep learning there so i am looking at possibly of uh, applications that are under telecommunication department and there i will be walking through to understand how deep learning can be applied broadly somebody says what is deep learning the answer to deep learning is people will say that whenever i want to learn something more and more deep uh, then you call it as a deep learning so it's a general layman term as a keyword says deep learning you want to learn more so what you see in this diagram is a connectivity of the deep learning to the other approaches broadly speaking if you are given a data you would always know how to reason a data let's take you go to a doctor and uh, say to the doctor that you run with a temperature of let's take value as x then the doctor would say okay if your temperature is x so naturally you are running into a fever and uh, how the doctor says it's a fever is the knowledge of the doctors are uh, makes him very clear that okay this person is having a temperature as x which is above a higher value so there is a possibility for a fever now doctor by his experience will ask okay what is the age of yourself based on the age the doctor will say this seems to be a very high fever or this seems to be a low fever so what we are looking at there is something called as a rule based algorithms so given some data you can always look at rules on the data and the rules will help you to say how the data is can be classified so there are a lot of approaches which are based on rule based algorithms examples are decision based trees which is a very good algorithm for formulating the problem now you take the same scenario the patient gets some medicine from the doctor goes back after 3 days the patient comes in and meet the doctor and says last 3 days i am running with the same temperature 
then the doctor by his experience and knowledge will start saying okay you have a value of x as a temperature but the temperature has not reduced so it is not a normal fever you fall into a specific some other type of fever which needs to be diagnosed so with series of tests the doctor says you fall into a fever but the fever type is let's take y so here what i'm keeping before you for your discussion is something called as x which is fever and the type of fever is called as y right so any problem that you are interested in solving will give you data like this so you need to reason behind the data and you have to say what class it falls into here in this case the class is called as x because it is fever and the class type under the x is called as y okay so i am keeping you keywords right now for you what you have with yourself is a fever right and you have the age of the person you can call it as features and what you are interested in knowing is a fever so the fever is going to be a class under the fever the subclass is something called as a fever of type y okay so this class as such falls in keywords like interclass intraclass and so on let's see what are interclasses what are intraclasses if you if you take a kid and show to the kid let's take a car and the kid has seen only car the kid will say that this is a car so let's take you ask the same kid to look at a van and say is it a car the kid will say it's not a car that's all so it's all fall into something called as single class problems so you are given input about only one specific class based on it the problem learns and says it falls into a specific class now the same kid is taught about by showing okay this is a car this is a van the kid will actually be able to recognize that if you show a car the kid will say it's a car if you show a van the kid will say it's a van so all this falls into something called as multi class problems right so based on your problem whatever you are working in telecommunication you can always see what are features features are meaningful values about the particular problem and once you take the features you will be able to say what class it belongs what you see in the associativity on the left side is everything falls under problems like deep learning but deep learning is always related to machine learning and artificial intelligence now let's ask a common question what is the relationship okay so artificial intelligence is the way in which people say that i am able to create computers which can solve problems in the way in which the human beings think so what can machine learning do machine learning also can do the same thing but the difference keyword would be is like what type of data you are going to give if the data that you are going to provide is going to have lot of uncertainty then you need to go for machine learning and if the uncertainty is very high wherein you are not able to classify it properly then you go for deep learning okay now <clears throat> let's talk about what is uncertainty here all of us are experiencing under the covid right all of us know what is covid and what are we talking about covid everybody knows now every day when you switch on your computer or switch on your tv it starts saying that okay the covid case is 100 then it says 200 then we believe okay the case is increased only by 100 next day they say okay the case is increased by 500 next day they say okay the case is increased by just 50 okay so there is no model which is certain with which you can actually predict such scenarios so the data that you work itself is uncertain okay so the problems of this nature is an example of uncertainty so if the uncertainty is very high then you can always go for a machine learning or if you feel still it's not working properly you can improve the accuracy by going to a deep learning concept now right below the slide what you see is a basic a diagram which is indicating what happens in a neural network in a neural network what you say is you are giving many inputs each inputs are associated with a weight so every input will have a equivalent weight what you see in the middle you can see that the product of the inputs and the weights summed up together based on the output that you get you check whether it is greater than threshold if it is greater than threshold based on with that you can say whether it, it is able to fall into that same output or some other output so what is this output it's a class label that you want to classify right this is for a typical neural network now come to the right side of a deep learning concept what you say in deep learning is deep learning also says i have neurons right but you can see on the right side of the diagram we start saying something called as layers neural networks also has layers but the difference is something like this if you come to deep learning there is an input layer and you can see hidden layers the hidden layers can be more than one but 
the number of hidden layers that you want to provide can always increase based on the amount of knowledge that you want to learn. This is one difference between your conventional neural network and deep learning based architecture. And output again is going to be same what you see in a neural network. As I told you, you want to classify two types of classes. Here you're going to have two outputs. So this is what you can see as output layer. So what a deep learning says, given a data, then I'm interested to have layers. So the first layer would be an input layer. Then what I'm going to have is more of number of hidden layers, and I'm going to classify it to a specific class, right? Now, a deep learning always talks about a keyword, something called as weights, which can be adjusted. So what is weight adjustment here? If you see on the diagram on the left side, each input is having a static weight that is being provided. But when you come to the deep learning, the weights are being provided. But in the forward process, once it learns, what happens is it will calculate something called as a loss. If the loss is going to be high, it can go through the back propagation phase and it will rerun again and it will again calculate the loss. So at every iteration, what happens is it tries to find out the weights that is able to capture the knowledge and the weights that are not responsible for capturing the knowledge will be getting degraded. Okay, so this is one difference between a deep learning and conventional neural network. So a deep learning will be able to learn the features, will be able to automatically change its weight values. That is its weights are adaptive in the case of deep learning and it converges until the loss is minimum. So please keep in recap. Data given as input to deep learning. In the forward phase, the loss is being calculated. If the loss is high, it automatically can go through a back propagation nature. And in the process, the weights gets adjusted and it goes forward until the loss is becoming minimal. This slide is for you to understand the summary of what I have been trying to talk about. So artificial intelligence is a way in which people talk about building systems which are intelligent in terms of computers as humans. Machine learning, we talk about algorithms through which you will be able to classify the data and further predict. Deep learning is again a type of machine learning which talks about data. Here we have got different algorithms with which deep learning can be solved. Now, today's uh, scenario is all about building data and talk, trying to talk about how the data can be classified. Now let's talk about a case of COVID itself for understanding. Let's take you go, go back to December 2019, right, where we started getting cases of COVID in country like China, just for example. That is the first sample of data with which we started doing the analysis. Now, going forward now, you see many countries all around the world having COVID cases coming and every day you can see the numbers changing. So if you would have asked a question back in December, how is the COVID cases increasing? There is no answer because nobody knows what is increasing, what is decreasing in terms of COVID because there is no benchmark to compare, right? But now if you ask a question, if somebody would know, okay, is the number of cases increasing for COVID, people will say that, yes, I have something for China because China as such has got an increase. That means it has touched the peak and then it has declined on the right side, right? Now there is no COVID cases. Now it is suddenly trying to have some numbers. So you have a reference data, which is from China, from which you can frame an hypothesis. Okay, please take this keyword, which is called as hypothesis. So given some data, if that data is the first set of data, like what we have for COVID, then there is no class label being provided. You have to formulate a class label value by using a hypothesis. So once a hypothesis is fixed, then automatically you can use any algorithms, which can be either machine learning or deep learning. Now in summary, if there is a data which is not having a class label, then what you will go for is a unsupervised learning. If there is a data which is having a class label, then what you will go for is a supervised learning. So you see two learning techniques. One is called as unsupervised and next is supervised learning. Now this slide is for you to keep a small pointer whenever you work with problems. Whenever you look at problems and if the data is going to be continuous in nature, like you see a stock market data, or you see a mobile traffic coming from your mobile network, right? Live streaming. So it is continuous nature. There, you just can be formulated as a regression problem. So all you are supposed to do is form a hypothesis, as you can see in the slide. 
and you can say any given data will fall above the hypothesis or fall below the hypothesis. This fits to something called as a regression problem. The other case is a classification nature. If there is a data which is discrete in nature, it is not continuous, then you can formulate it as a classification problem. So here again, you can go for a supervised algorithms for classification. What you see below is something called as clustering. Clustering, as you can see from the diagram, if you have a data, you can actually use some hypothesis and you can break it into different clusters. As you see on the slide, you can see three clusters, one with orange, one with blue, one with violet. So what do these clusters say? The cluster says all data instances within the particular cluster are related, right? Okay, let's go for the concept of how it can be looked at the mobile traffic data. If you talk about users in mobile data, you, a mobile communication company would be interested to talk about what sort of an incentive they can give. Certain users will get automatically a message saying that we give you 100 uh, GB free. But if you look at some other user, the user would have got a message saying that you will give you only 10 GB free. So what is the difference? Why somebody is getting 100 GB free? Why somebody is getting 10 GB free? It goes through some rule that if the company feels I have a provider and uh, I'm able to have customers, but the customers are not using the internet maximum. They want to promote the customers by saying that I'm giving you more free GB space, right? Gigabyte space. If the company feels that in my customers, there is a customer, but whenever I give a free GB space, the customer is trying to use that also. Then they come back by trying to minimize the amount of free internet uh, bandwidth that is being provided. Okay, so formulating a business use case is a challenge. So based on what the owner of the product needs, you can actually form the clusters, right? Uh, right side, what you find is something called as anomaly detection. Uh, developing models are very important because they should be able to give us what is anomaly. So what is anomaly? Something which is different from a natural pattern. If you look at a heartbeat of somebody, right? Okay, suddenly the heartbeat is very high and it show, as shown in the graph, it goes very high. Then the doctor will say, this seems to be something like, which is needs to be monitored. Okay, the same thing if you look at a stock market, the stock market is low, suddenly goes very high. It is again an example, right? Okay. Now you take your mobile bills, which you have been paying for the last four to five years. Let's take you go back five years back and see what was the mobile bill you have been paying. And now if you see what is the mobile bill you have been paying, you'll be able to see some up, some downs and so on. Wherever there is an up, it means that it is an anomaly which needs to be monitored, right? So data is very important. Based on the data, you can actually talk about what is anomalies. Now, <clears throat> this slide is to capture what we want to give us a essence for deep learning. So given some input data, we want to go through a feature engineering phase. That means we want to find what are the features. See, feature engineering, people take it in different perspective. You can actually say, if I have five columns, right? Each column is a feature, so all my features are ready. Or somebody would say, I'm creating a new feature, which is added out of it. Like for example, if you go to a, um, let's take a company which is giving you internet, right? And you go to the company and say, this is my customer ID. Just with your customer ID, the company will say, sir, we already have an incentive offer. You can actually have more connections in your same um, uh, payment that you're doing and so on. So there is some features which can be created from the original data, right? And it is dependent on the domain of the problem, right? Then third is what you can see, whatever learning algorithms that you want to apply, you can go for and you can run the model. Now, right side, what you see is an example of a diagram which speaks about deep learning. There's a cat image being given, right? So given the cat image, what the deep learning does is it uses many layers. As we have already taken through you in the discussion, the layers are called as input layer, hidden layer, and third category of layers that we have tried to talk about is the output layer. So given some input, it passes through the input layer and then the set of hidden layers. And in the output, it classifies what type of image it is. Here in the example, it wants to classify it is a cat or not, right? Now, <clears throat> deep learning is very important in the way it says that I can learn the features. So what is learning of features? It is again a way in which it understands the data. For example, let's take you look at this cat on the left side here. Deep learning would say, okay, this is actually a set of pixels, right? Each of them are pixels. Okay, what I have with me is pixels. 
So first, uh, first step it learns and knows what are the pixel values. Then it looks at the color of the pixel value. Then based on the color, it understands, okay, this is all white, right? And the background is black. Now, once it learns that, it will be able to see, okay, all these white pixels that are being there are connected. Okay, so this is one, seems to be one edge, okay, as I'm showing you on the cap. Now, bottom right, it will be able to see that, okay, there is a circle with black, there is a circle with black. So this is not edge, this is going to be region. So region one, region two. Based on the rule, it will try to understand that, okay, two regions are closer to each other. And based on the data that is being provided, it may be an animal or it may be a human and so on. Now, if it wants to categorize between this is an animal or a human, just because with the eyes are being provided, we provide some more learning to the model and say that, okay, this is an animal or not. Okay. This is how a deep learning does. Deep learning will take, just take data and from data, it will form the features. Like I told you, pixels given. It will be able to find edges and from edges it will be able to find regions and based on the interest that it knows it will be able to say this belongs to head nose eyes and so on so uh, the summary is like this so whenever you're given any data make sure that data is understood as features okay now we will take through one uh, sample of uh, understanding features now let's take through the sample for understanding the features. This is an example of a data which we will also walk through at the end of the session. Okay, This is uh, a data which is live, which is actually taking through the customer analysis. right? So if you can see here, each of them that you can see here is called as columns. right? Each column is having some values. And the last column in any, gate, any data is called as class. Okay, So if you can uh, try to understand the class that you have is called labeled as churn okay ch u r n we are interested in knowing that whether the customers are having a churn nature or not we'll come back to that now if you walk through and see you can find one value as no another value as yes no yes no yes no yes so it is basically a class label of two values which is yes and no so it is a binary class problem I think people can understand, right? So if there is a value saying yes, no, right? And there is a value saying maybe, right? If, if you have a fundamental question, how many classes are there? People say that there are three classes. One is yes, one is no, and next is maybe. So the strength of developing a model is given a value which is available for all these features, it should be able to classify which class label it is. Here in this slide, uh, in the Excel sheet, what we are presenting is three classes. Yes, no, and next is maybe. Okay. Now, let's come to the challenge of this data. Each data that you can find here are not just numbers, right? You can see patterns, like what you can see under customer ID. You can see numbers, like what you can see in this column. Third, again, you can find values, which can be characters, text, and so on. Here, you can find binary values, right? So values and numbers are also being available with fractions, right? Okay. So this is a challenge behind the data, right? Whenever you are given a data, the challenge behind the data is to understand what is the characteristic of the data. So why are we talking about this is if you have two rows, which are just numbers, right? Based on the numbers, you can form clusters, right? Let's take us, we ask a common question. How much is your balance that you have in your account? Each one of you say one balance value. Based on the number, we can say people who have balance between 10,000 to 20,000 fall in one cluster. People who have balance between 20,000 20, 1 to 30,000 fall in another cluster. People who have greater than 30,000, please fall in three, third cluster. So just by numbers, it is very easy to aggregate the clusters. But if you just have values like this, which are going to be characters, strings, and so on, the challenge is how do you form clusters? Right. Okay. So there, what people suggest is these are all categorical values. Wherever you have strings, you can call it as categorical values, and you can go for some approaches for conversion. One common approach is something called as one not encoding. So if you have a data for your analysis, and the data is having categorical values, which can be characters, strings like that, please follow through on one not encoding and convert it to a numeric data part. So uh, this is how you have to look at data. Any data that you have, please walk through the features and each one of them is a feature, right? If somebody asks you how many features you have, you take all these features and put it separated by comma, 
leaving the last column that is the number of features that you have this is called as feature vector okay set of features separated by comma is called as a feature vector what is dimensionality reduction is the dimension generally corresponds to the way in which the features can be understood you know very well that when you plot a graph you need an x and you need a y axis same way you need two columns to talk about a feature dependency right that means number of features minus 1 will give you the dimensionality of the data if you have n features here n minus 1 will give you the dimension of the data so there are approaches wherein you can actually convert or downscale the features you can say originally it is n but the number of features have got reduced right that's called as dimensionality reduction we will come back to what is dimensionality reduction in the coming slides okay uh, so now this uh, slide as such should be clear for you what is feature Uh, each column is a feature feature vector group of features separated by comma dimensionality reduction number of features minus 1 is a total dimension value if you can reduce the number of features it's called as dimensionality reduction uh, dimensionality reduction is again a domain based problem if suppose you look at a mark sheet of a student and there are five subject with the marks somebody can say roll number and total alone that means you are not talking about the five subject marks you are just saying roll number and total right okay so dimensionality reduction can be done at the problem level that based on the domain that you work class label is the last column in the data classification as i told you if you have a data without a class label you should be able to associate a class label to that which is a classification problem there are many problems uh, which you can look at any every problem can be either formulated as a regression problem or a classification problem so this are the takeaway points which you should be keeping in for your next uh, understanding now one is called as filter so whenever you are given a data the data is understood to be an image so the reason is deep learning architectures was originally developed for image processing so every image that is being taken right is actually a square value so number of rows is equal to number of columns so you will have a filter which will be able to be applied on the image so the filter is called as neuron or a kernel so the purpose of filter is the the filter will have values which are called as weights okay so next is depth of the filter depth as such is very important because the more the depth value the better the learning in the model so if you have an input image let's take the image size is 32 cross 32 it's going to be a color image so it is rgb so you're going to have three matrices so the total input is going to be 32 cross 32 into 3 the filter let's take the size is 5 cross 5 again it is an rgb right so it is 5 cross 5 into 3 so after applying your filter on the given input right the, what you will be left out is something called as activation map or a feature map right okay so next would be is like we have some parameters through which you can modify the behavior of each layer layer again we have already given you what is layers we have said hidden layer as a keyword for your first level understanding so one operation is called as stride stride will say how the filter can move over the input volume for example somebody can say this is an image i can move the filter from the top left side somebody can say i'll move the filter from the top right side right somebody will say no no i'll move the filter in the middle the face is anyway going to come only in the middle of the screen i want to detect a face so i will look at the filter by moving the filter only on the middle part right so stride will say how the filter can actually convolve with the given input uh, volume that's your image right then next is padding padding is a way where you can look at modifying the behavior of every data that you are trying to process so what you see at the bottom is architectures rcnn and all that and uh, this architectures are generic but sometimes what happens is for specific application you should go for a particular architecture right so when you want to work with your problem please go and see what architecture is available with respect to your telecommunication problems so next is forward pass as i told you whenever you are trying to take a deep learning architecture once it starts with the first epoch epoch means the first iteration it goes forward right and once it goes forward what it will be trying to do is it will try to calculate this part right as i told you so whatever it has got calculated is called as loss right so when it is able to calculate the loss the loss is expressed as a difference of expected minus actual that means every neuron as such will be able to say which class it belongs right at the first iteration so when it's once it says it falls into a specific class 
it is called as expected the class that it to which it belongs is called as actual right numerically when we look at the difference it's called as loss so that is loss l so as i told you every uh, architecture will run for more than one iterations until the loss becomes minimal so with, during the back propagation as i told you it will look at the weight and it will try to have an adaptive adjustment to the weight values in such a way that the loss becomes minimal so given a data that you are interested in processing here it becomes a telecommunication based problem the you look at an architecture let's take your deep learning architecture is there for you then you will be interested to say how can i say my model is working or not right so there are some parameters to talk about this first performance parameter is precision second is accuracy recall false acceptance rate and next is false rejection rate in this you can see some keywords like tp which is true positive tn is true negative fp is false positive then next is fn is false negative okay right <clears throat> so let's take uh, you are um, you are trying to use your mobile right and you find that uh, your mobile um, is having lot of outgoing traffic right but your mobile as such is having only small applications running that means you are also not having multiple traffic going with your application nor the number of applications in your mobile is also less in that case it becomes a suspicious activity right so originally if you say the outgoing traffic is going to be less because as a user with my mobile i know my usage is very less it is an example of a sample that needs to be understood so certain samples will be called as positive samples and certain samples will be called as negative samples so whenever you are interested in classifying a data you will have to look at the data and see which is called positive samples which are all negative samples right so if your positive samples are available and if it gets misclassified as negative sample after applying your architecture that's your deep learning architecture then there is a conflict that means a positive sample is recognized as a negative sample right there we will come back or where we will be using this matrix will be very important we will try to say how many number of positives are classified as positives it's called as true positives the same we will try to go for the contrary and talk about false positives the same comes for the negative samples how many negative samples are classified as negative samples it's true negative the contrary part of it will be called as false negative so if i have 10 rows of data and i have got something as positive something as negative after applying my deep learning architecture i will have to find exactly how many positive samples are misclassified as negative samples how many negative samples are misclassified as positive samples that count will help me to calculate all this performance measures precision accuracy recall false acceptance rate and next is false reject recognition rate this metrics are generally with machine learning but when you come to deep learning you will have new set of metrics here the metrics that you will find different is first metric is called as false discovery rate false discovery rate is given as 1 minus precision similarly you will find average precision mean average precision top one error rate and next is top five error rate see deep learning architectures are basically stochastic based approaches that means they are more related to probability based right let's ask you ask you an understanding okay what would be a probabilistic approach and how it will help us uh, the common uh, information would be is like somebody says i am interested in uh, uh having a data that needs to be classified okay let's take for an example um so it's like this you have a class a okay and uh, you have a class label b you have a class label c a b right c right so the input class data is originally as a b c a b c that means i have six records first record is a second is b third is c next is abc again now i am giving to a deep learning architecture okay now this deep learning architecture classifies like this right a b 
they can say a b c this is how a machine learning will be able to give you a result a machine learning will say given a particular data it will say what is a class it will belong say it is a b a b c a now if i ask you a question how many misclassification has happened people immediately will say the third row is originally c but misclassified as a then they will say fifth row is originally b but misclassified as c then sixth row misclassified as a right so total number of misclassifications are three here now if you are going to give it to a deep learning deep learning is a stochastic approach it will give you the probability of the match for all the other classes now here what it will say is let's take for example it will say like this okay it will say okay this is b this is a this is c this is a b next b next is c now the deep learning will give you uh, advantage just see here this class originally as c is classified as a if you are going for machine learning but deep learning will say in the second class probability it looks like c okay similarly this class input a which is originally provided is classified as b but in the second class probability it says it is a right similarly when you come to the last that is c it will say in the last lower class probability it looks like c right this is the other big advantage of deep learning deep learning will say the possible probability a input falls to all classes that it has learned so the all classes that is it has learned is a b c for example a given at first higher probability is a next higher probability is b next higher probability it is c this is a very key difference of deep learning with machine learning approaches now let's come to the aspect of modeling a problem your telecommunication problem that you talk about would always say that i am giving you some data so collecting data is very important so if you are let's let's take you are looking on a mobile traffic data please approach a company which is a mobile provider and ask them that can you give me some data it's a data collection is a very costly process in fact the next is data pre processing a data that is being provided might have some noise for example uh, if you say a column is of number if i have a character somebody would say it is a noise but noise as such is basically a yeah approach which needs to be understood from the domain of the problem also for example if somebody says there is a column called as a mobile bill right and the bill amount is just 6 rupees people will say it is not possible because tax alone and a normal uh, plan that comes up will cost at least more than 50 or 60 rupees right so based on the domain of the problem you can address what is data pre processing the next is what parameters need to be assigned here in deep learning we talk about two types of parameters one is general parameters and next is hyper parameters general parameters are fixed parameters for example how many neurons it's a fixed right certain parameters are hyper parameters like for example what is activation function what is the learning rate right so all this becomes hyper parameters so tuning the hyper parameters is next a big challenge as i have highlighted you in the slide why this hyper parameters need to be tuned is I, as i have been repeating again and again whenever the loss has to be minimal when it goes through the back propagation process it has to change the parameters or it has to adjust the parameters in such a way that the loss becomes minimal right so there parameter tuning is important and approaches for parameter tuning you can try to see how possibility of using optimization now you can see uh, the current year trend is looking at more of possibly using bio inspired algorithms with the deep learning architecture okay so tuning the parameters can be tried by using bio inspired algorithms also on the level on the layer of uh, deep learning architecture the next is stopping criteria when is your deep learning model going to stop you usually people say it is the factor is epochs right you can say n equal to 30 so 30 epochs i have given okay it stops other way of doing is like you can always see what is the minimal loss that you want to stop at minimal loss that it has reached then at that point you can write your code in such a way saying that the stopping criteria is met last is visualization what plots you are interested in providing right okay what would be your graphs that you want to provide 
all that you can bring it under visualization deep learning tools it depends on your uh, comfort some people will say i'm going for java somebody would say i am interested to look for tools which are based on python c++ and so on but from my team and from my uh, input what i would suggest is keras is one common good framework with that you can try to use either theano or tensorflow but again if you ask like okay which is good keras with theano or keras with tensorflow one input that i got from the professors is something like tensorflow is built on c++ so naturally it's better to go for tensorflow uh, with keras reason is c++ is faster compared to python that's one input that i got but not the least you can always look at some other frameworks also which are there for deep learning now when you look at data as i told you the data that you take can be any data that can be captured it can be image video or it can be a mobile traffic data also now when you are looking at the challenge with respect to the wireless and mobile networking environment the input that i was able to infer is one is like you can have libraries or frameworks as i suggested it can be tensorflow theano or you can go for cafe torch mxnet mxnet is more of a java based platform you can use any of this deep learning libraries you can try doing some optimization algorithms reason for optimization as i told you like you want to minimize your loss then you can go for some optimization algorithms which will take care of the learning rate right then in application stream people suggest okay we are moving to cloud we are moving to fog okay so their possibility of a good hardware with a software also is a good uh, uh, challenge the right side what you are uh, trying to see here is from the paper right research paper that's published already so what they are trying to say here is like there is a need for parallelism in developing all this deep learning approaches for mobile network so you you can look at parallelism in models you can look at parallelism in training and uh, next what they are trying to project in the paper is like since deep learning is not at for only one type of data right it can start taking on the data and it can learn over the environment you can assume that the deep learning will go for a longer time and that's what we are calling it as deep lifelong learning and now there is growing focus for people to use transfer learning along with the uh, deep learning approaches so when you look at uh, applications on telecom right the there are some challenges one challenge is something called as accuracy if you talk about accuracy for a face somebody would say yes i have accurately classified this person okay so it leaves see same person as sendil kumar or x or y okay by knowledge but if you are having a data which is coming from a telecommunication domain it is sometimes very hard to reason what is accuracy so this is one challenge papers are talking about what is accuracy in a telecommunication data is still a challenge the next is what is right sample what is wrong sample is also very hard as i told you uh, if i want to monitor my mobile uh, assuming that somebody is trying to steal my data in a live communication i would always say i don't use mobile for a more time right so by model they will assume that my time with the mobile is less and they might try to develop a model but let's take now i am trying to use the mobile for last 30 minutes so my mobile traffic is high at least my mobile data that is getting used is high right so how to distinguish between good sample and bad sample in telecommunication data is also hard okay that because there are a lot of probability to say the data is good or bad this is a second challenge given by the paper the third is data dependency so only when you have data you can actually model the problem so getting data with respect to mobile networks is little very costly so that is the third challenge the next is energy execution part see whenever you run architectures like deep learning if you ask the experts or the people working on problem they will say it is not running in computer it is needs a big uh, massive processor so i got a laptop which is around 1 lakh plus or somebody would say i got a gpu which is 3 lakhs plus somebody would say i got a rack server with gpu facility i'm i'm increasing the computing capability of the code but 
if you look at a telecom department or let's take you as a mobile user want to have a deep learning architecture to monitor something from your mobile then it cannot run on a mobile which has got some limitations in the hardware right so developing a code for it and uh, giving a higher accuracy for it requires lot amount of energy utilization also so that's the next uh, limitation the next is hyperparameters so how do you put your hyperparameters how do you define your hyperparameters that's a biggest question because whenever you are able to have more hyperparameters and tune the hyperparameters then the depth of learning also increases right so there are people suggest you can go for uh, tools like auto ml and you can try to see what optimal hyperparameters can be chosen this are limit some limitations that are given in the paper in case you want to go for deep learning with uh, mobile networking which is again a telecommunication part now right what you can see here is some algorithms that are being proposed in the paper so these are algorithms which are proposed for fast optimization sgd rms prop adamo all these are optimizer if you go to deep learning they'll ask you what is the optimizer that you have used you can say i have used adam rms prop or sgd so this are some that are used for mobile networks then libraries we have already told you can be tensorflow pytorch then cafe 2 then if you are going for fog computing you can go for deep sense or you can go for uh, core ml also the next is what sort of systems that you are interested in having so if you are going for a distributed machine learning systems example would be gaia or tx2 or if you are going for a parallel architecture you can people will suggest for you to go for gpu or tpu if you're going for a fog computing hardware you can go for nnx kiran sun 50 right kiran 970 so this is just a slide again from the research paper for you to know okay if i want to go to deep learning with mobile networking taking telecommunication as my domain so this is a way in which you can look at the uh, components and formulate your model so when you look at features this is one thing that people generally need to look at deep learning has got lot of max so without mathematics there is uh, no deep learning as far as i would always put up so uh, at least uh, a good input or understanding on matrices then partial differential equations would help you to understand what deep learning is trying to do right so now what i'm trying to keep it for your understanding is if you have a data and you want to understand what is happening in the data it's a telecommunication domain for example you would be interested to know meaningfully if it is given as statistical features like for example if your mobile card provider has started in your place an office the end of the day the mobile provider would be interested to know is how many number of active connections how many number of disconnected connections how many people have requested for change over of providers somebody has a connection in vodafone the person goes and request for uh, changing over to atel or from atel to vodafone right so the individual provider would be interested to know how many new connections are coming how many connections are getting migrated so new connections coming is good but people migrating is a disadvantage they will be interested to know why the person is migrating so formulating a business case for all that would require some statistical features so please try to hear mark your problem and see whether there is a possibility for looking at some statistics against your telecommunication data that you work so once you are in the space then you can always look at architectures that you want to start with in deep learning there are many architectures but it's always preferable to start with cnn which is convolution neural network later you can go for any other architecture which is not tried for telecommunication or you can look at an architecture which is already existing for the telecommunication problem and you can modify the architecture according to your work or your research so there are many use cases that i came across when i try to start looking at telecommunication problem first one is called as fraud detection as the name indicates you should be able to know if there is only a normal traffic in your mobile but if there is an abnormal traffic in your mobile then that means a program is laden in your mobile and it is stealing your data its data could be all your images or messages or whatever important which could not be shared or which need not be shared right so this falls into something called as fraud detection next is customer segmentation that means based on the customer importance and the way in which the customer interacts with your business use case you can segment the customers saying high profile low profile customers 
or you can say this customer is spending more in the last one week or this customer is using more mobile bandwidth right or if the customers are using more mobile bandwidth in the last uh, 15 days of covid can they be given a new plan okay so all this is more related to customer side this is called as customer segmentation a more related word to that would be called as profiling the next one is called as customer churn prevention what is this is diagnosis of the customer's behavior and enabling alerts highlighting that the customer is having some risk okay so this is normally done by the applications that are installed into the mobile what the applications will do is like whenever a data which is part of your transaction is tried to be seen by somebody else who is not authenticated right when they are trying to access your data from your mobile it's like stealing your data from your mobile without your knowledge then they try to give some alerts so this is what we call as customer churn so we will come back to one sample for that the next is lifetime value prediction so here what we try to understand is like okay given customers what is their purchasing behavior what type of services they have utilized and can you give a value for the customer right okay so can you say this is a this is customer is a gold customer privileged customer and so on the next is customer sentiment analysis this is more about what sort of reaction the customer is trying to express okay so the sentiments are more important because uh, you are reaching to a customer right and uh, reaching to a customer is because of many sources for example let's take you are pinging on the internet and you are trying to see a product right let's take the brand of the product is xyz right and if that product company has got a software to know that this customer has seen my product in less than a day you will get a message to your mobile saying customer you have visited this product are you interested in purchasing this product this is more about sentiments okay so this is more about the feedback that we gain the way of looking at sentiments is from different sources somebody can look at the product somebody might try to search for the product see a product review in the facebook right if they see a product review in the facebook also it means that they like the product or they want to know about the product so data can come from many sources it could be normal interaction by the user or from the social media which can allow a possibility to know the sentiments behind the customers so there are many data sets for looking at all this what you can see on the right side is just expression on sentiments what you see on the left side is what you see about the different product data set that is being available you can take any of this data sets and you can try looking at models so when you look at most of the data the data will have something called as normal data and a metadata i am putting you this keyword called as data and metadata because people usually look at working on data but they don't worry about metadata but you ask industries they will say okay given a data what is the metadata they are worried for example if you talk about a, a, a company right okay let's take they run through a mobile provider now you as a customer you go to the office of the company and say that see i am a customer and uh, i have not paid my bill right okay uh, but i got a fine so can you give me a wavering of the money it's a normal request okay so one possibility they will say is like they will look at the system and they will say yes sir wavering is done you need you not pay the you need not pay the amount which is a fine pay the original bill alone right now this is normal data now what is getting recorded as metadata is person name with fine being wavered in the month let's take the month is let's take now we are talking about may right may the person has got a waiver now the same customer goes back in june goes to the company and says see i forgot to pay the bill and it's a fine can you reduce a bill amount or can you give me a wavering now when they go and look there will be a metadata reflecting that metadata would say this customer has already got a wavering in the month of may so person in the office would say sir it's already provided so we cannot give you this step so this, this is the importance of metadata so knowing a suspicious customer now knowing whether it's an anomaly with the customer now this customer is falling into an anomaly data because he is regularly coming for and wavering right okay so if the company feels no no i can give and wavering for two times 
the provider will say yes sir this time we are giving third time we will not give let's say the same customer comes back in july the the company would say sir we gave you a wavering in june may so we cannot give that means what is anomaly is based on what the owner of the product looks at if the provider feels only one time wavering more than one time is an anomaly for the customer side if the provider feels no no two times i can give wavering then more than two times that customer becomes an anomaly so metadata with respect to the data needs to be taken and that depends on the application that you are looking at so i will uh, show you one uh, one excel sheet which has got the data and metadata part Yes. So what we are talking about is uh, uh, customer churn. As I told you, customer churn in the sense like uh, uh, taking some features about the customer. We are interested to know whether the customer's data is being stolen or whether the customer is needs to be monitored with respect to the transactions what he is doing in the mobile. The features are all these are other features. Okay. as we told you each feature has got value so given some model we are interested to classify whether the customer is having a churn or not okay so it will if it says churn then it is an alert if it says no then the customer need not be monitored that's a conclusion from here now taking through this taking through this there is a code which is there in the internet which is populated into kaggle i think you will be able to see it on the screen what i am trying to show you now this code is built on support vector machine this is on the data that i just showed you i'll just walk through this uh, so that this gives you a feel okay when you want to go back and start working this can be one problem that you can look at so here in the code they have done it using python so python as such will say that it's importing all the libraries so one is like it is using numpy and next is pandas right pandas is more for data processing and uh, working with csv file the data that we are working in excel sheet is again can be taken as a csv file right so then what it does is it is trying to load the data so when you want to load the data you are supposed to use a method called as read underscore csv because the file type is csv here here we will we'll give the file name that we want to load so this is the excel file which we have just seen now then we call the method called as head when you call the method called as head so it will take the columns names and put it as a headers for showing the data now the data is shown before you as you can see here the data is shown before you with the values now next what we want to do is we want to do some operations on this so we are loading some more packages one package that we are doing is we want to work with graph so we are using matplotlib and next what we are doing is we are using sci py right sci py which is for helping us to use more functions for doing the mathematical operations then what we do is we take the columns and we are trying to show the statistical part as you can see in the left side you can see the statistics coming count mean standard deviation minimum right all this so from your given data there is a statistical measure which is being provided and the data is now shown then what we do is we will try to take through a dist plot this plot is again a plot through which we will be able to understand something about the data so with the dist plot we can see that okay it's showing you a histogram plot plus it is showing able to show you some peaks as you can see here this is one peak which is in the lower another peak which is in the higher part then what we are doing is we are trying to go through a correlation and we are trying to generate a heat map so what a heat map will do is like will show you the association of the features right with respect to the classes features of the other side 
so you can see here monthly charges tenure and uh, senior citizen so as you can see here all this corresponds to the values that you have just now seen right senior citizen tenure and excess monthly charges right so once we are able to show a heat map that will give you a, an associativity of the features that you have generated right then what we want to do is next we want to take the same set of columns and from there what we are trying to do is we are going through approach of support vector machine and with support vector machine it is able to classify right as you can see here it is able to classify and say there are two classes as we told you in the excel sheet we showed you churn as a feature there are two class variables for it one is yes and next is no so classes with zero as labeled have been classified right and classes with one also have been classified now the question is how many number of classes with zero has been properly classified zero in the sense i am talking about this one all your information this is a data set we are trying to use in the model so here there's going to be only yes and no right so how many number of yes has been classified as yes how many number of no has been classified as no this we are doing it with a support vector machine right okay so what it does is <clears throat> what it does is after running through the support vector machine it shows a performance metrics precision recall f1 score support so if you look at this class with 01 has a precision as 0.84 but class with 1 has a precision of 0.62 so the interpretation here is the class with 1 right has a lower precision value right so you can look at fine tuning the model for improving the precision okay this are the other metrics recall f1 score support and you can see the average for each of this right precision micro average macro average weighted average now this is how you can actually run through a specific algorithm or an architecture to understand what is happening behind the data here the telecom data that we are talking about is a customer churn analysis right so moving back and asking your question what can be done somebody would say i'm using a deep learning architecture wherein my precision is not 0.62 for class 1 where in the precision has increased to let's take 0.80 then that means that deep learning architecture is good okay now here i would like to put you a question people usually ask this as a common question where should i go for deep learning where should i not go for deep learning see if it is a problem which nobody has solved right and the problem is live so it is an unsolved problem so taking a deep learning for it or a machine learning for it is a good appreciation all you want is you want to solve the problem like if you go back to december 2019 covid data has been fresh nobody has looked at solving it right so if you have taken a machine learning let's take you have taken a linear regression solved it presented it as a good article that would have got accepted reason is it is an unsolved problem you are solving it for the first time but if it is a solved problem like you see here no the the churn data for telecom it is solved and with svm they have been saying that for class 1 the precision is 0.62 it is a solved problem so if you are going for deep learning the question would be is like okay what is the amount of precision that you got with the deep learning architecture if you say i am getting let's take 0.80 then your your thought process is correct okay this is how you can actually look at deep learning then other question people usually have in mind is how many rows should be there in the data it's 100 1000 all that here actually i put the same question just see whether the data can grow with time you talk about india if you ask about january how many cases we have we would say that okay we started getting the first case in the january let's take third for example if it is on fifth people would have got i i saying that i have only two rows of data one for january third one for january fourth i am sitting on january fifth but now if you ask yourself you would say i got 5 months of data now you look at your data you would say it is there for states now then you will say no no it is not a state it is a town city it is a village is everywhere this covid spread is there for example i have a full picture of my data my data is growing so when my data grows then the data is going to increase in size so that is a need for deep learning why people say that you should need a big data for deep learning is like this if there's more data then the feature engineering will work well and the learning part and the representation of knowledge will be very high because deep learning at every back propagation as i told you 
adaptively changes the weights and learns the knowledge. So if there are more data, it can learn more. That's why people say that you need a big data to uh, work with deep learning model. Okay. Uh, this is one thing which I am trying to keep it for you. So, so we have made one tool uh, with myself, with my students. Uh, we are calling it as a metadata tool. This tool actually has the capabilities to do analytics. And uh, uh, this tool is able to do the concepts which a machine learning tool also can do. So what is the advantage of this tool is we are built on Python. And uh, we are in the um, initial uh, prototype version of the tool. And we have pre presented this as one at one of the premier conference in Japan. Okay, the, the advantage of this tool is, as I told you, you give a data, it will load the data. If you want to do a uh, noise analysis, it will say you what are the approach for noise analysis. And when you click a button, it will automatically do the noise removal. And if you want to do a dimensionality reduction, it will ask you how many features should I create. If you say just create five features, but originally the data has got 10 features, it will do five features conversion by using algorithms which are there for dimensionality reduction. It will give you a reduced feature set. Then if you want to do any classification or prediction, you can click on the algorithms and which are available. Let's take support vector machine, uh, K nearest neighbor like that. And you can see the analysis part as, as what I showed you now, precision, recall, accuracy and so on. So initial prototype of the tool is ready. So we are getting it to uh, an academic version and we are trying to see how it can be provided for the outside usage. So that's it uh, from my side and thank you to the audience and uh, thanks to Shanti ma'am and thanks to the team for getting me on board. Nice, it has been sharing the session and uh, keeping in forward, I work in the area of uh, video analytics with uh, deep learning. My scholars work in video analytics and uh, deep learning. And a couple of my scholars have started working on network security and uh, deep learning. So we are looking at behavioral systems on deep learning. And my PhD guide has been Dr. S. N. Shivanandam, sir, formerly professor of computer science from PhD Tech. He's my guide, guru, uh, because he only brought me into this uh, machine learning field. And with whatever he has taught me, I'm putting my footprint and moving on. Thank you from my side. Uh, you have we can take on through the question and answer session. Yeah. SVM part of the code. Um, sir, SVM part of the code, I'm not getting the question. I, support vector machine uh, is an algorithm and you can use that algorithm as a supervised model. So if you have a data which is uh, gone through a training and it is having a class label, you can go through with a support vector machine and uh, predict the data. And based on it, you can find out what is the precision recall accuracy. What's the difference between supervised and unsupervised deep learning procedures? Very direct question answer for you all. If you have a data and the data is not having any class label value, like I told you, you, know, if you are in December, you just go started getting the number of cases. You don't know whether we are going high or low, peak or whatever it is, right? So there, what you say is a data is there, but there is no class label for it. So there you have to go for a supervised learning. So there, example of a supervised learning is you can go for a, a k-means clustering. With that, you can classify. And then you can actually use the rest of the data to predict. Or if it is a continuous problem, that's a continuous variable problem. You can formulate it as a regression, find the hypothesis, and then given any data, you can say whether your model fits or not. Uh, next question, it's a layman's question. What's the use of filters? Why do you use it? Okay, filters as such are basically for doing convolution. It's something like a, a, a dot product operation. So uh, the resultant of applying a filter will be able to give you the knowledge that you want to learn from the given data. And as a result, it gives you an activation map. And uh, the other answer would be, it's like it's part of the architecture design. Can you suggest any sources for basics of deep learning? Okay. Um, basics of deep learning, uh, there's nothing like that, but uh, uh, you can always listen to online uh, uh, YouTube lectures, which are based on deep learning. 
but when you want to start with deep learning, please go and brush up some part of Max. Or when you learn deep learning, you should have a mindset to go and learn Max also because you need probability, uh, you need a bit of statistics, and you need uh, to know about matrices and differential equations. If you know all this little bit, then you can always start with any online course which is there in deep learning. Other answer would be is like you can go to Coursera. There are a lot of courses in Coursera on deep learning. With that also you can start. Okay, how does it work when you when we add satellite image with deep learning? See, it's not like adding satellite image with deep learning. Your image data is satellite image, right? So when you talk about an image data which is a satellite image, naturally the size is very high. So when you want to process on such a higher size image, then we talk about high resolution images. So there are algorithms that, that are there for a high resolution image. Uh, in uh, satellite image processing also, people suggest support vector mission. Reason is it can handle noise very well if you're going for satellite images. Which language is best for image with deep learning, whether MATLAB or Python? Okay, um, answer is like something like this. If you are going to be in an academic segment and uh, you uh, cannot use a, a, a pirated version, better to go with Python. The reason for going for Python is Python is more compatible when you go to onboard platforms. Let's take it as going to be an embedded device on which you want to put your code. The answer would be is Python because most of the IoT devices are Python based. So my suggestion is to go for Python. But easy learning, you can go with MATLAB. I would like to thank Dr. Sindhul Kumar sir for his wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Hope this seminar is very useful to implement real-time projects in deep learning. My heartfelt thanks to our management, principal, vice principal, deans, HODs, and faculty members. Once again, I thank all. Now, all the participants are requested to fill the feedback form. Based on that only, we will provide the certificates. Thank you once again. Yeah, so thank you, ma'am, and thank you to the team. And uh, at the outset, as I told you, I have uh, people working in video analytics and network security. So if you feel at your uh, institution, if you want to uh, have some sort of association where your students want to get some input or want to try out some joint problems with my team, uh, please write a mail. Uh, we will always see the academic part, and we will try to associate. That's all. So thank you so much. And thank you, madam. And thank you to the institution for this opportunity provided. Thank you.